that long walk from pain to pain? Has there ever been a time when it wasn't pain for the black man? And this is just to put it succinctly. Yes, the black man. I mean, life is pain, isn't it? Few years after childhood, in such times as the 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries, survival was without the modern day quotidian structure, purely reliant on chance, game, raw animal instinct. And so, as it was with the whites in those days, so it was with the blacks, for all humans are here to survive, or die in the event of surviving. However, while living did eventually became better for the white man who was known to be engrossed in the quest for so-called civilization and advancement through science and technology, living, on the other hand, had become worse for the black nation whose underutilized lives would only deteriorate into a living nightmare. By invasion, colonization, and slavery for the longest time. And is not this what brings us to one of the world's darkest salient histories on black oppression and suppression? The story of none other than the resting giant, Nelson Mandela, the great fighter of apartheid in South Africa, is one we do not want to forget in a hurry. We're taking you back in history on this day in 1964. Nelson Mandela was sentenced to life imprisonment. The man who dared to oppose the apartheid regime in South Africa was accused of sabotage. In his 27-year jail term, Mandela was confined to a small cell and was forced into hard labor, but he remained unbroken. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, as senators and representatives, we went to jail because it was impossible to still, to sit still while the obscenity of the apartheid system was being imposed on our people. It would have been immoral to keep quiet while a racist tyranny sought to reduce an entire people into a status worse than that of the beasts of the forest. It would have been an act of treason against the people and against our conscience to allow fear and the drive towards self-preservation to dominate our behavior, obliging us to absent ourselves from the struggle for democracy and human rights, not only in our country, but throughout the world. Imagine spending nearly three decades of your life in a state of imprisonment only because you stood up for what is right for your people. The controversy surrounding the Nelson Mandela story will always be one nothing short of extraordinary courage, resilience, and unduplicatory determination. One, the entire universe and generation unborn would live learning from. Our people demand democracy. Our country, which continues to bleed and suffer pain, needs democracy. It cries out for the situation where the law will decree that freedom to speak of freedom constitutes the very essence of legality and the very thing that makes for the legitimacy of the constitutional order. It thirsts for the situation where those who are entitled by law to carry arms as the forces of national security and law and order will not turn their weapons against the citizens simply because the citizens assert that equality, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are fundamental human rights which are not only inalienable but must, if necessary, be defended with the weapons of war. We fight for and visualize a future in which all shall, without regard to race, color, creed or sex, have the right to vote and to be voted into all elective organs of state. From the early days of his activism to his historic presidency, 
Mandela's life was a testament to the power of the human spirit. We have made it very clear in our policy that uh, South Africa is a country, a country of many races. There is room for all the various races in this country. There are many people who feel that it is useless and futile for us to continue talking peace and non-violence against a government whose reply is only savage attacks on an unarmed and defenseless people. In a world where the color of your skin determined your fate, a country torn apart by racism and inequality, Mandela dared to challenge the status quo, and he would not cower from the consequences that would follow. Mr. Speaker, we are acutely conscious of the fact that we are addressing an historic institution for whose creation and integrity many men and women lost their lives in the war of independence, the civil war, and the war against Nazism and fascism. That very history demands that we address you with respect and candor and without any attempt to dissemble. What we have said concerning the political arrangements we seek for our country is seriously meant. It is an outcome of, for which many of us went to prison for which many have died in police cells, on the gallows, in our towns and villages, and in the countries of Southern Africa. Indeed, we have even had our political representatives killed in countries as far away from South Africa as France. Unhappily, our people continue to die to this day, victims of armed agents of the state who are still determined to turn their guns against the very idea of a non-racial democracy. There would be interesting details coming up from unseen directions in this video concerning the resting icon amongst us. Join us here on Black Journals as we explore the extraordinary life of Nelson Mandela, the battles he fought, controversies surrounding his days in prison, and the enduring legacy he left behind. Do well to encourage our steadfast production by hitting the thumb button. Share with friends and families to also access these eye-opening stories that you are getting from us. And do not forget to subscribe if you are yet to... All right, we got some catching up to do. Let us dive in. Good evening. For 27 years, six months and six days, he had been a prisoner. During that time, he became a legend, a symbol of black resistance to apartheid, and to many, he became a martyr. Tonight, he is a free man. Nelson Mandela, the leader of the African National Congress, he walked out of a prison on a gloriously sunny South African afternoon. This was the noon of the 11th day of that month of February, 1990. Truly extraordinary day. A day so many have waited for for so long. The day Nelson Mandela was freed from prison. We start with the CBC's Jean-Francois Lepin. There's Mr. Mandela, Mr. Nelson Mandela, a free man taking his first steps. It was the very day that millions of South Africans had dreamed of for years, which many had fought and died for. The day had finally dawned. Nelson Mandela emerged from his long nightmare as a simple man walking his way to freedom accompanied by his wife Winnie. But his release meant probably more to the whole world than to the man himself. Outside, crowds of supporters had waited hours for that very first glimpse of the man that most of them had never even seen before. More than a quarter of a million people came here in the center of Cape Town hoping to hear Mandela's first public address. At one point, the crowd was so dense and the security so inadequate that Mandela's motorcade couldn't make its way through. It was a day of jubilation and euphoria as tens of thousands of supporters of the African National Congress 
legal for only nine days, welcomed their leader. Many in the crowds were not even born when Mandela was sentenced to life imprisonment 27 years ago. Tens of thousands of people in electric excitement and unrest like never before, raging to see the man they've heard so much about from the tongues of their older generations for 27 years. There's the possibility that many amongst the crowd present may have already begun to think the story was some kind of myth and were there to see just for their own eyes. Organizers spent hours trying to control the situation, but it only led to further unrest. As groups of people began to leave the rally, riots and looting broke out in the streets. Such emotionally overrun youths. They wouldn't wait. Mayhem and looting would be the only unhealthy resort to express the uncontrollable agitation they may have felt. Waiting on their old leader that day, indiscriminate shootings by South African police had also begun. In the name of a happy day, and South African police forces reacted in panic, shooting almost indiscriminately. Dozens of people were wounded. Journalists were also hit. Thousands of people in Cape Town would stream into the city for a rally on the Grand Parade in front of City Hall to welcome Mandela and listen to the struggle icon's first public address as a free man. I've never been in a place where you felt so calm, so happy, a kind of peaceful joy, people dancing and chanting. If the government was under any question about who Mandela was and who he led, these people are speaking with one voice chanting his slogans, calling his name. That day, activist Vanessa Watson had decided to stay at home and watch the historic event on television, rather than make her way to the parade because she had a one-year-old twin. As she sat watching the TV and waiting for the newly released struggle icon to address the rally, however, a friend would knock on her door. He told her that Mandela was right outside of her home. We were expecting him to appear on TV at any moment, so I couldn't believe he was just outside my house. Watson had said out of untellable hysteria. I had assumed my friend was mistaken. She said, her emotions overflowing. Vanessa Watson, now a professor of city and regional planning at the University of Cape Town, would go on to further report that when she went outside, she had seen Mandela sitting in a car looking relaxed and pleased. The car that had driven him from Victor Verster prison in the nearby town of Parle had been forced to divert because of the huge crowds. The people were raving to see Mandela. Mandela's small convoy would regroup in the street outside Watson's home in a suburb close to Cape Town to decide what to do. When Watson greeted Mandela with one of her twins balanced on her hip, he had asked her if he could hold the young boy. This was an early insight into Mandela's great love for children his humility and his gift for connecting with ordinary people, traits that were to become the hallmarks of his presidency. Vanessa Watson here again. I was amazed and delighted. First, that he was outside my house, and secondly, that he just wanted to hold a baby. I couldn't believe this was happening. He didn't seem at all awkward. He seemed very comfortable to hold a child. This was Mandela's second close encounter with children that day after his long years in prison, surrounded by fellow adult prisoners and their jailers. You just imagine what it feels like to be finally free after serving 27 years behind bars. Mr. Speaker, Nelson Mandela.
Such a killer smile with such a raging crowd is one you don't forget in a hurry. The freedman waved at his people, a people he hasn't seen for 27 whole years. We are not talking about 27 days here, or 27 weeks. 27 days is a long time to count, you know, isn't it? But this is a whole 27 years of painful severance from a man's family, a man's people, a man's wife, a man's home, and all his loved ones. His life crumbled all at once, and for being good and true, for not being the real enemy of good. This all hurts beyond words. But after 27 damn whole years, a man would just have to start again. No choice. His entire family, no doubt, had felt flaming indignation. Hurt, wounded they were by such unforgivable wickedness towards them, which has had their father, their friend, uncle, husband, brother, stolen away from them for 27 whole years, shut out and away in a maddening tiny prison cell for 18 years, and then transported off like some brainless, planless, less than a human being to only God knows where for another nine years to do some extra captivity. And yes, captivity which has been the black man's world for way too long, his family should feel vengeful even, and would be righteous to feel so. Mandela would be turned into some kind of superstar, ensconced in celebrity ship after 27 active years of his God-given precious life had been denied him. He had come out, an old man. But what could an old man possibly do with superstardom, huh? I tell you, this only wore him out even more, as that biological age and time was at his days of rest. Mr. President, I see the beautiful garden here at Tainais is still exquisite and so special. Do you have a chance to, as in the old days I read in your biography, you wore a straw hat at Polsmoor and worked in the garden. Do you have a chance to enjoy yourself here? Well, that is one of the things I regret very much. <clears throat> because in prison, I could sit down at the end of the day and think, do nothing else but think. And uh, I was able, therefore, uh, to see myself uh, in a different light and to be able to correct the mistakes, at least to have a plan to correct the mistakes we committed in the course of our work. The hard truth was the man had been defeated by the enemy in the long run. He couldn't have pulled the task through all by himself. There was rarely anyone who shared his guts at the time. At most, people would speak up only in their closets and at least they would act along in public all the while he was away. This was apartheid at rule. Mandela, a.k.a. Mandiba, was that type of man that people always needed, to be by their side, for them to trudge on bravely in keeping up with the struggle in question. But after he was caught up with and hidden away from sight, alongside others, many of whom didn't survive, the whole struggle had sadly melted down, like a punctured tube. And then decades later, he had come out from prison, a broken old man. Mandela's endless succession of visitors would inevitably ask him to voice political opinion, but he refused. I'm no longer in politics, now. I'm just watching from a distance. Yeah. And when people come to me to say, uh, what do we do with a situation like this? I say, no, go to people who are in politics. I'm no longer in politics. <laughs> I've retired. <laughs> and of course, what should any old man want in this meaninglessly furious world other than some peace? One of Mandela's hallmarks had been to oppose even close allies when they chose to settle scores by going to war. They need to talk to people and to say, you know, what are we quarreling about? And uh, the most powerful method of resolving issues his peace. People rejoiced at his return, but he had been there with them for 27 years, hidden away while people went about their businesses. On the drive through one of the poorest sections of Brooklyn and later at a high school, it was clear that Mandela is a hero to millions in America, too. People rejoiced immensely at his return, but those who had played a part in his long-term jail time were right there with him, in the eyes of everyone. Those who had taken his life away from him were never touched. And it was clear that he was having a good time. A big crowd. But that was nothing compared to the throngs of people who waited hours in the financial district 
for the traditional welcome New York gives heroes, a ticker tape parade. The first since the Mets won the World Series in 1986. Security for the visit is intense. The New York Police Department built a special Mandela mobile, bullet and rocket resistant. 12,000 police were on duty at a cost of $2 million dollars in overtime, the tab picked up by the U.S. State Department. At New York City Hall, Mandela received the key to the city and gave a promise. Apartheid is doomed. The world elites and their unchecked tendencies were buzzing all around the man like swarms of bees around a bag of honey. Even long after his retirement from politics, foreign leaders still clamored to be seen with Mandela. And Gordon Brown was no exception. Well, uh, my wife and I are very happy and proud to be here because, as you know, this was one of our rulers. <laughs> but we overthrew them. They all wanted to take photos with Mandela, while others would invite him nonstop for meetings, each wanting their own share of show-offs. Thank you. Saibona, Dumela, Molo, Haller. I've come to see a very old and dear friend. He also happens to be probably the most famous person in the world. <laughs> Mr. President, everyone in the world wants to spend time with you. And here you are with me. I must thank you. It's a wonderful honor to be back here in Tainhuis. He toured from one country to the other. He had suddenly become the pleasure of everyone and everything aristocratic. But the truth was, he's been there for a whole long 27 years, and nobody gave shit about him. If anybody did, then a human being created by God shouldn't be locked away for that long for actually doing nothing wrong. He wasn't locked out somewhere on some other planet far from reach. He was locked up here in this world amongst humans, in some place called Robin Island, built by men. And people were behind such cruelty. And they were people of power. Inhumanity has continued to rule over humanity. And good people have perished for so long for being God's people. He was sentenced to prison for waging a war. He had come out of prison looking for peace. But the reason behind the war he had brought on, for which he was sent to prison, had not been defeated. This may have been some intelligent psychological ploy all along by his oppressors, to keep him up restrained in jail until his active days of manliness ran out. When we walk through the breakfast room, not to make conversation, but just greet people. Okay? Oh, but no, we're going through the breakfast room. Yes, and we are a bit late, so... Okay. Good morning. Though this statue is of one man, it should, in actual fact, symbolize all those who have resisted oppression, especially in my country. Mandela's endless succession of visitors would inevitably ask him to voice political opinion, but he refused. I'm no longer in politics, no, I'm just watching from a distance. Yeah. And when people come to me to say, uh, what do we do with a situation like this? I said, no, go to people who are in politics. I'm no longer in politics. I will tell They succeeded at this. There was at some point the stir of some controversy even concerning the strange transformation in Nelson Mandela's behavior that his close ones had claimed they noticed about him on his reunion with them. There was the talk about him being the fake Nelson Mandela. It was said that after his 18th year in the penitentiary on Robben Island, Mandela had been transported to only God knows where, and after nine years had returned a different person entirely. Were they expecting him to come back out of jail as hot and vibrant as he used to be when he was younger? After 27 whole years of insane torture and soul-breaking? Mandela had spent 18 years of his prison term on Robben Island. He was held in a small cell without any plumbing, sleeping on a mat on the stone floor. 
During the day, he did grueling work laboring at a limestone quarry. Lime is a very difficult thing, you know, to dig because it is in layers. It is between layers of rock, hard rock. The authorities took efforts to keep him hidden from the world. Once a year, he was allowed a visitor, but only for 30 minutes. Despite his mother dying in 1968 and his eldest son being killed in a car crash less than a year later, he was not allowed to attend their funerals. However, he still managed to smuggle out letters and advocate for the ANC. In 1982, he was moved to Polesmore Prison in Cape Town, where the damp conditions contributed to him being hospitalized with tuberculosis in 1988. The apartheid government throughout this time periodically made offers to release him, but the freedom that was offered was always subject to government conditions, which Mandela resolutely refused. In 1989, F.W. de Klerk was elected South African president. The following year, he announced that he was lifting the ban on the ANC and ordering Mandela's imminent release from prison. It would be inconsiderate of anyone to expect that he would come out of that hellhole the same man. However, one could never really tell what it was these people saw changed in him, though. Only these intimate observers would know better, inarguably. But one thing remains certainly clear in all of this. 27 bloody years in a prison cell is more than enough to change any living human being who somehow didn't die in that living hell. Let's even look behind our shoulders to get a glimpse of the fiery political character the man Mandela once was in his prime, in those dark, horrid days of apartheid. Back in the primitive landscapes of Eastern Cape Province in South Africa, the remarkable individual on the 18th, the month of July, 1918, had been born with the name Rolilala Mandela. Rolilala, which translates to pulling the branch of a tree or troublemaker in Xhosa, was a name that would become prophetic. Mandela's life had eventually turned out to be one full of twists and turns that would test his resolve and challenge his convictions he would have to walk through inevitable troubles and nightmares. They were the only roads before him, given the circumstances of his state in those terrible days of apartheid. Mandela's place in history, more generally, cannot be appreciated without a basic understanding of what South Africa's apartheid system amounted to. That apartheid is at last fading into the mists of time makes it all the more necessary to take a detour to provide context. Apartheid, the legal system of racial segregation, which governed South Africa from 1948 to 1994, enforced a strict division between the country's racial groups, particularly disadvantaging the black majority. Nelson Mandela's autobiography, Long Walk to Freedom, offers an intimate glimpse into the life of a man who became synonymous with his struggle against apartheid. Since the arrival of Dutch settlers in the 1600s and British colonists in the 1700s and 1800s, South Africa has been a project that subjected black people to systematically segregationist laws and practices. But it was the adoption of apartheid in 1948 that codified and formalized these racist practices into law. It strictly separated people into separate classes based on their skin color, putting the white minority in the highest class with all others, including black, indigenous, multi-race people, and descendants of indentured Indian workers below them. South Africa's road to freedom was long and bloody laden with the bodies of thousands of black activists and students who dared to protest, both loudly and quietly. The horrific affair of the Sharpeville mass killing in 1960, when 69 black people were shot dead by police while protesting the pass laws, was in fact what proved to be a turning point for Nelson Mandela. This had enraged his spirit. People had tended to feel that we had done everything in our power to try all options open to us. Mandela told Joan Bakewell in a BBC interview in 1990, Not only was there no improvement as far as our living conditions were concerned, but the government took advantage of our commitment to nonviolence and decided to be even more vicious. It was under those conditions that we decided to resort to violence. Said Mandela, a comprehensive system of racial segregation undergirded by a plethora of intricate laws Apartheid had been in place since 1948 national elections, with Hendrik Verford, who served as Minister of Native Affairs, and then as Prime Minister from 1958 until being stabbed to death in Parliament in September 1966, serving as Chief Architect. Apartheid, which can loosely be translated as apartness, had many aspects, 
but the common denominator and overall purpose was the systematic separation of whites, 60% being Afrikaners, the descendants of 17th century Dutch settlers, the rest English, and non-whites. It was mind-numbing in its precision. There were laws enforcing residential segregation, the Group Areas Act, prohibiting sexual intercourse between whites and non-whites, the Immorality Act, mandating separate educational institutions and specifying the content of textbooks used in non-white schools, requiring separate restrooms, bus stops, and ambulances, and defining the guidelines for commercials featuring white and non-white actors. And that's just a sample. Blacks required authorization stamps on their internal passports, which they had to have on their person at all times in order to be lawfully present in white areas. Black farm workers had to seek written permission from their employers before they could accept better paying jobs in cities. Those who had urban jobs were, depending on their classification for employment purposes, confined to townships, single-sex dormitories, or homelands. In one form or the other, all blacks were deemed to be citizens for these homelands, which the South African authorities claimed were sovereign entities because whites constituted 15% of the population but controlled 85% of the land and the best parts. This effectively made blacks foreigners in their own country. Other non-whites, Asians and so-called coloreds, or people of mixed race, endured daily discrimination. But the oppression faced by the South African black was in a different league altogether. As Joseph Lelyveld has recounted in his book, Move Your Shadow, South Africa, black and white, Apartheid was just because it rested on a multitude of laws. To defy it, therefore, was to engage in illegal conduct or worse, sedition. It followed that to punish such acts was legitimate, that the system was enforced not just by blatantly unfair laws, but also through the systematic use of arbitrary imprisonment, torture, and extrajudicial murder was omitted from this curious legalistic defense. The September 1977 slaying of the black nationalist Steve Biko while in police custody was perhaps the most notorious example. Most whites knew next to nothing about the daily lives of blacks, among the features of which were poverty, long commutes to work, police harassment and daily indignities, separation from families for those working in cities far from home, and yet would speak freely on the black character, psyche, and preferences. In other words, the system was benevolent, indeed in its victim's best interest, they'd say. Rebellion therefore amounted to what Karl Marx called false consciousness, or ingratitude, or worse. And this stereotype enables so many whites to rationalize apartheid to be blacks' innate inclination to violence. Of course, why shouldn't they? Living at the apex of the ladder gives them nothing to worry about. APA apartheid laws separated South Africans into four different racial categories. 1. White and Europeans, 2. Blacks, 3. Colored, that is, people of mixed race, or four. Indian and Asian. White people, 15% of the South African population, stood at the top of society, wielding power and wealth. Black South Africans, 80% of the population, were relegated to the very bottom. Many South Africans would begin rising up to defy apartheid. Tactics included civil disobedience campaigns, national strikes and boycotts, Nelson Mandela would join this struggle in the 1940s as a young lawyer. By the 1950s, he had become an important leader in the struggle against apartheid. Mandela's political journey had begun at the University of Fort Hare, a center of African nationalism, where he was expelled in 1940 for participating in a student protest against the university's discriminatory policies. And this political awakening would intensify in Johannesburg, where he pursued his legal studies and was exposed to the full extent of racial injustice. These events inevitably sparked his involvement in the African National Congress, ANC. Joining the ANC in 1943-44, Mandela was instrumental in the forming of the ANC Youth League. He had co-founded this revolutionary league alongside Walter Sisulu and Oliver Tambo. They aimed to revitalize the ANC, pushing for more radical action against apartheid. Determined to achieve his goal, Mandela did not stop there. He had also opened South Africa's first black law firm with Oliver Tambo, providing legal aid to those affected by apartheid laws. He was a political monster, 
a true monster of justice and irrepressible domination for the South African people. One notable example of his early activism was the 1946 ANC, sponsored bus boycott in Alexandra Township. Mandela, then 28, helped organize the boycott, which lasted for several months, protesting against increased bus fares and poor conditions. The boycott was successful, but also led to Mandela's first arrest in 1946. Mandela's leadership and oratory skills had quickly made him a prominent figure, in 1950, he was elected president of the ANC Youth League, and his activism intensified. He played a key role in organizing the 1952 Defiance Campaign, a nationwide protest against apartheid laws. Mandela traveled the country, recruiting volunteers and coordinating protests. He was arrested multiple times during this period, facing charges of treason and violating apartheid laws. One particularly close call had occurred in 1956 when Mandela was among 156 activists arrested and charged with high treason. The trial, known as the treason trial, lasted five years, with Mandela facing the possibility of a death sentence. He used this time to continue his activism, using the trial as a platform to expose apartheid's injustices. In 1960, Mandela helped launch the ANC's armed wing, Umkanto Wesizwe, Spear of the Nation. He became the group's commander-in-chief, overseeing acts of sabotage and guerrilla warfare against the apartheid regime. These activities put Mandela in grave danger. He was forced to go underground, adopting various aliases and disguises to evade capture. In 1962, he was finally caught, arrested, and sentenced to life imprisonment. This was indeed a long walk to freedom. In closing, Mandela combined the traits of heart and mind to exercise several very different variants of leadership. He was a political dissident and an insurgent. He was a prisoner of conscience. Few leaders have been able to play such varied parts in the drama of politics. The traits that are necessary to do so are seldom embodied in any one individual. Nelson Mandela had the intellect, character, and style to move from one demanding role to another. For that and more he will long after death claims him, be remembered as one of history's most compelling and greatest figures. That brings us to the end of yet another thought-provoking video. Do not fail to like, share with friends and families, and subscribe to stay tuned in if you're yet to. We are glad to have you here with us. Thank you for watching. See you in the next video.